Uh, I want you to know right off the bat, Pastor Veronica and I love you guys so much, man. You guys are in our hearts, in our, in our prayers um, consistently. It was about five years ago that um, in our time of sabbatical, the Lord had put on our heart. We take it like every summer. We're actually coming off of sabbatical right, right now. This is my first sermon in like three weeks. So you all about to get all of it, okay? So, so check it out. Um, in our time of sabbatical, though, we, we always just, we use some prayer, reflection, vision, forecasting, writing, and it's always a special time for Veronica and I. About five years ago, the Lord put on our heart, though, uh, of an identity shift. I don't know if you've ever had God speak something into you. It was like, you were, you were here, this is who you've been acting as and walking as, but you are no longer Jacob, you are Israel. You ever had something like that, a moment like that? Man, I hope tonight's going to be a moment like that for you guys. I really do. God wants to speak to you, but he spoke to us, and he spoke about our identity as church planters and how this was engraved. We planted Discovery 10 years ago. It would have been five years ago then, and um, it was, I don't know, it was just like who we were, man. We were, it was the grace of the grind, man. We were, we were going for it. We were advancing the kingdom of God forcefully, reaching people for Jesus, rescuing free people from the grips of hell, filling up heaven, man. We're like, we're going for it, man. This is who we are, who God has called us to be. And then the Lord said, you've been, you, you've been acting like and living like a church planter, but I've called you to be a spiritual father. And so he spoke this, and actually in our own times of prayer and fasting, to Pastor Veronica about spiritual mothering and to me about spiritual fathering. So today, I want to talk to you about um, sons and daughters. How many of you know that, um, well, first of all, how many of you love Jesus here? Do you love Jesus up in here? Am I? Okay. So, so if you don't, you're in the right spot anyway. I think what, what we have for you, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be able to apply and, and, and bless you. I really do. But when you come to Christ and, um, you know, God doesn't make, like, there are some things that you and I just immediately, God removed and, and shook off us and broke off us, but then, then there are some other things, though, that stayed with you, and you kind of had to walk out, and you had to work out, so today, I hope that it's going to be kind of some walking out and working out, and there's going to be some fresh revelation for you to see some things that maybe you were not able to see, not ready to see, or had eyes to see up until this defining moment today. For you to go from one stage in season or identity to shift. Oh, God wants to shift you today. He wants to move in your life. He wants, he wants to transform you from the inside out. I, I love this, this promise, this, this prophecy of, actually it came from Amos, but it was reiterated in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It says, in the last days. Somebody say last days. days. Y'all believe we're believe, living in the last days? We're living in the, biblically, theologically, the last days of the time from Jesus' resurrection to the time where he's coming back. So that is the theological term for the time we're living is the last days, but we're closer now, I believe, than we have ever been. I see the signs of the times are on, the, the writing is on the wall. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. How many of you want some of God's spirit? An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. This is how he begins this, this, this movement, this latter day reign. It's going to start with sons and daughters. Can I get an amen, somebody? It's going to start with people who have an identity as a son of the house, as a daughter of the house. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. This, ha this is a prophetic word that, that comes from the Old Testament. This is the nature of God, always desiring. This is how God moves. God moves generationally. God desires to get what is inside of you to the people coming after you and through you, that there would be a spiritual transference from one generation to the next. We would give God glory and praises, that we would transfer it. So it was always this way. And the, de the enemy knows this, by the way. The devil knows this, which is why he's always trying to block, block your blessing. You see it all throughout the scripture. This is the, the, the first murder in the Bible, right? Cain versus Abel. Came from brothers in a family household that the enemy was trying to come and divide, come in to put a wedge between that which God meant for generational blessing. He wanted generational curse. God always intended sons and daughters to be the recipients of the outpouring of his power and his spirit. 
let me ask you guys a question as you assess something today, because we're going to peel back some layers. Do you have a, any fear of rejection? You don't need to answer out loud or anything, but just maybe in reflection. Do you have fear of rejection? Do you have difficulty trusting others? Do you have low self-esteem or, or a difficulty forming healthy relationships? Or maybe you either fear isolation or have a, even a sense of isolation or a lack of belonging. Do, do you have any trouble receiving affection? Do you, do you have any trouble with people in authority? If any of those or multiple of those are true of you, as we peel back some onion layers before the Holy Spirit today, then you may be dealing with an orphan spirit. You okay if we go here this tonight, you guys? Because God has called you to be a son and daughter, but the enemy wants you acting like an orphan. In John chapter 14, verse 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Now, he wasn't speaking as like the father, like he's our father. No, no, no. He's, he, he's speaking about a spiritual place, that, that there is a natural orphans, but there is a spiritual orphan, a spirit, an attitude. Being an orphan is not your portion as a son and daughter of God. It is a lie of the enemy to get you blocked, prevented from receiving everything that God has promised you. An orphan spirit... It's a state of mind or an emotion characterized by feelings of abandonment, rejection, loneliness, and a lack of belonging. And if you're feeling some of those things, and that has been characterized throughout either your childhood or your adolescence or your current life, you, you may be dealing with an orphan spirit. Let me show it to you in this story, a very popular story. Um, most of you know who know the Bible in Luke chapter 10, the story of the prodigal son. Let me, let me read you a few verses here. Verse 25 through 31. It says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. That's a bold statement right there, don't you think? I've never disobeyed your orders. You, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him? My son, the father said. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found now. I want to show you today six signs of an orphan spirit, and, and I'm going to show you six ways to overcome this orphan spirit you may have today that you didn't even know that you have. It's what's preventing you from, from activating everything God has for you, from receiving what God has for you, the outpouring of the blessings, the favor, and the spirit of God. That is your portion, but you're not able to receive it because the spirit you're walking in. Six signs of an orphan spirit. Are y'all with me today? Because, I mean, come on now. I'm ready to preach. Y'all better preach back to me, okay? Number one, it lives. The orphan spirit lives in, re in, in religious people. Now, I'm not talking about the, the, the church maybe that doesn't clap or something like that or doesn't shout or, or, or wears long dresses, I don't know, no makeup and stuff like that. I don't, that's not the, I'm not talking about like the style. Religion has nothing to do with the style of the service. Religion is what's left when the relationship is non-existent. Relationship or religion can, can happen to, to people who jump and shout and clap. It can happen to, to Baptists, Catholics. I don't, it doesn't matter. Religion can happen to anybody who loses revelation of who Jesus is. Because, because Christianity is not a religion. Listen to me, it's a revelation. Jesus, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And all of his disciples were saying, this is, they're saying you look like him, and you're this person and that person. And then Peter answers, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, 
Flesh and blood, blessed are you, Simon, son of Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. There was a revelation that you received from heaven that revealed this to you. The core of Christian faith is revelation. You cannot follow Jesus if you don't get a revelation. You cannot. You can appear to be Christian. You can go to church. You can go through the motions. You can belong to a Christian household, but religion doesn't have revelation. Religion makes orphans. Revelation makes you a son and a daughter. In our text today, the son came home from wandering, the, the, but one son was actually in the field. One son came home from wandering, but another son, look what it says, the older son was in the field. Both sons, listen to me, this is what I want to submit, you, submit to you today. Both sons were lost. One was lost, chasing prostitutes and parties, and one was lost in the field. One son was lost in rebellion, and the other son was lost in religion. One son came back in repentance, and the other son stayed in the field. He worked for his father, but he didn't know his father's heart. Religion is man's attempt to receive the gift of God's love and acceptance through my efforts instead of God's great gift to reach me. Only Jesus offers something different. Revelation. Now, I'm not, don't confuse that with like something mystical or super spiritual or, or some impartation or something like that. I'm talking about revelation when Jesus becomes real. Not just someone you read about or study about or the enlightened one or the good teacher or someone to, to the miracle worker. He, when he becomes real in your life, the orphan spirit lives in religious people. The second sign is that that orphan spirit, it brings out anger. Anger is just one letter short of danger. The older brother, it says, became angry. Religious people are angry people. And if you deal with angry, anger, listen to me, you need a revelation of who Jesus is in your life if you deal with anger. It's true, anger can be holy. God gets angry. Anger can be an appropriate response to injustice. Sometimes anger is an appropriate response, but anger can be an open door to demonic strongholds. Ephesians 4.26 says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger, giving the devil a foothold. See, the son worked hard for his father. But his anger was triggered when he saw his younger brother receive with a party. He was received with a party and a celebration. Orphans are angry people. Maybe if you get triggered by anger a lot, maybe you have an orphan spirit. Here's the third sign. That orphan spirit pushes a person into isolation. See, nobody with this older brother, nobody rejected him. Nobody was preventing him from going in the house. It was his own pride, his own entitlement. There wasn't, there wasn't like, oh, there's no room in there. No, look what it says in verse 28. The older brother refused to go in. See, an orphan spirit draws a person out of community and out of fellowship. It creates this false idea that they don't love me. Oh, they don't, they're not for me. Oh, I'm not accepted there. I just don't belong there. I don't feel like I fit in there. They're so critical. That orphan spirit pushes you into isolation. Even, even Doubting Thomas, you've ever realized that Doubting Thomas, when he doubted, he doubted because he was not with his brothers and sisters when Jesus was in the room. And, and, and doubts get magnified and amplified in isolation. The proverb says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires, and he rages against all wise judgment. As Christians, we, were, we weren't meant to live in isolation. We're meant to live in community. Jesus said, where two or three gathered together, there I am in the midst. Never one, never one. He sent them out by two, never one, but by, but by two. It is a cord of three strands. It's not easily broken. I've heard people even say, confused by the enemy and this orphan spirit, even say and propagate a false idea. Maybe you've thought or said something like this. God just has me in a season of isolation. Listen to me right now. Isolation is not from God. It is always of the devil. That is always demonic. 
I said, no, 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 look, isolation is not from God. I'm not talking about solitude. There's a difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is an important momentary experience to get alone, to hear from heaven, to encounter God, to quiet my soul, to refresh my mind. Isolation is prolonged disconnection, always, always from the enemy, always. If he isolates you long enough, you're going to begin to think they are the problem. Everyone in the house is the problem. Everybody in there partying with him. All those people, they're the problem, but we don't battle against flesh and blood. You got a wrong spirit. You got a wrong spirit, son and daughter. You are not acting in the, in the posture of the calling that God has. You are a son and daughter acting like an orphan standing outside the house pointing at everybody else. I remember when I was, when I was younger, because of, because, and this is where the orphan spirit often begins, is, is in, in your early childhood years because of the rejection that we've experienced, of the abandonment that we have from our parents and people, the abuse, verbal or physical abuse that we received. And I remember I'm the second youngest of total seven siblings, and I experienced a lot of all of that, all of it, abandonment, abuse, rejection. And, and I could get along, listen to me, I could get along with everybody my age and younger than me, but anytime I was with anyone older than me or people with authority, I was already in a posture of, they, I, I can't be around them, I can't receive them, they don't like me. And I was just, I would be sitting, like at a party even, I'd be sitting in the park, like wouldn't even want to go to parties because they don't like me there, they're not going to accept me there. And, and I'd be sitting alone at the party, thinking in my mind, like, like, like everybody here is just stupid, man, it's just like, I don't belong here. It's not that they were rejecting me. I had the wrong spirit. I had an orphan spirit. Are you guys hearing me today? Am I reading your mail today or what? Okay. Okay, it, this, is, this, is, this is an attack of the enemy pushing you into isolation. Here's the fourth sign of this orphan spirit. It, it always carries a sense of entitlement, unfairness, demand, and control. So first comes the hurt and then the offense and entitlement. The younger son, that younger prodigal son, he squandered his inheritance. Remember the story? He squandered it all. There's nothing really in the father's house anymore that belongs to him. It all, everything else, because he squandered it, he already used it. Everything in the father's house is, his, is the older brother's. So here's what happened. When he came home, the father throws him a party with the older brother's stuff and didn't ask him. And so, this is, so he gets offended and entitled. How dare you use my stuff? He already... He, You've already squandered stuff. You using my cap? That's my cap. Use my stuff. Luke 28, look what it says. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, in exaggeration. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You owe me a goat, dad. Look how funny, I mean, that even sounds. The father gave him the farm and he feels entitled to a goat completely lost his perspective. Entitled people can't see straight. You're not seeing like the son that you are. You're seeing through the lens that the enemy has given you as an orphan. The scripture does not teach entitlement. The only thing that you and I are entitled to is hell. Somebody asked me just before the service, said, how you doing? I said, better than I deserve. They didn't realize that. I stole that quote from Dave Ramsey, though. That's a straight-up quote. That's Dave Ramsey. Because there's this mindset of, like, like, no, you deserve happiness. You deserve, no, maybe according to the doctrine of self-seeking, self-discovery, new age culture that we're living in, but the reality is you and I do not deserve good. Why do bad things happen to good people? It happened once, and he volunteered. Get rid of entitlement. He felt offended. It's not fair. Listen, Jesus didn't demand honor. He gave honor. Jesus didn't demand to be respected. He served people. You might think I'm preaching a doormat Christianity. No, 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 no. I'm preaching a cross Christianity. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Some of you are following an American Christianity. You mean following a Jesus Christianity. We have to get rid of entitlement and fighting for fairness. Fair. Because after that comes control. You'll start controlling people, trying to control people. See, the brother didn't go into the house, right? Which, which as in that culture, as a co-host of a party in that culture, one of the greatest insults you can give when you're gathering people is not show up. One of the greatest insults. It's kind of like if you were having a wedding and one of your family members didn't show up because they didn't like something. 
color of the dress or the cake or something like that. What are they doing? They're trying to manipulate you, trying to control you. They're trying to be demanding. That's an orphan spirit. First, we're hurt, then we're offended, then we're entitled, control, and demand. Also, that orphan spirit focuses always on what I did, not who I am. I don't know if you noticed, he said nothing about being his father's son when he was complaining to his father. He just, he said, I've been slaving for you. I've been slaving. And when his father came back, he told him, no, 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 you're my son. You're my son. You're not a worker to me. You're a son. And and, and that orphan spirit always sees what others got and never sees what they received, what they didn't get, what they don't have, which is why this fifth sign is this, that orphan spirit, it's jealous when others are promoted. Most of us don't know and we'll never know that we have that orphan spirit until someone who deserves less gets more before us. And then it shows up and it's ugly. You feel resentment. You can't rejoice with them. God forbid they credit 10,000 to David's account and only 1,000 to Saul's account. Saul struggled with that, man. King Saul was a good-looking man. He had the kingdom. He had the throne. He was, he was tall. The lyrics of one song drove him mad. Somebody got something he thought he was entitled to, something he felt he deserved. Someone else's blessing is always going to be your test. Every blessing is a test, and every test is a blessing because when you pass the test, God takes you to another level. But that test sometimes is not your blessing, but somebody else's. It's, it's, it's where you thought, man, I waited. I, I stayed pure, and this girl just gets saved, and she's already got a boyfriend. Man, God is not fair. I can't have children, and these people keep popping them out. Man, God, that's not, it's not fair, because I pay my tithes, and I give, and I serve, and, and I, I budget, and this person just doesn't do any of that, and luck follows them. Jeez, it's not fair, God. We feel entitled when someone gets something we think we deserve. You need to get rid of that entitlement and that jealousy. The first murder in the Bible was because of jealousy. Abel got what Cain thought he was entitled to. God is not a socialist. Socialism is, de- is demonic. Come on, somebody. I'm about to. Okay, listen. I don't know what you got taught in school, okay? Socialism is demonic. The idea that you put everyone on the same level, that doesn't work. God loves us equally, but he trusts us differently. Listen to me. You can't handle what God's trust me with. I couldn't handle what God trusted me with today when I was 28. I was about to be a lead pastor at 28. They were going to give me a church. I'm like, finally, man, I finally get to. And I'm like, I can do it the way that I know it should be done, man. Because I can do it. I can finally, finally. And, and I'm about to become a lead pastor, get a church. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, it's not time. You need to step out in order to step forward. I am so glad I did not assume a position that I was not prepared or ready for did not have the character to sustain that God had to take me on a journey because he loved me, but he couldn't trust me. Are y'all with me today? God rewards us differently, gifts us accordingly, and trusts us incrementally. You got to repent of that offense, that entitlement, that jealousy, and come back to the Lord. Cain killed Abel over that. Saul tried to kill David over that. The Pharisees killed Jesus over that. Someone else's promotion will always expose your silent frustration with God. The, other bro- o- o- the older brother said, I've always obeyed and worked hard. He wasn't complaining when his brother was broken in a pig pen, but only when he, his brother got found and was blessed. See, as long as they were broke, you were fine. As long as they were in need, you were like, I'm praying for you. But inside, you were happy that you were ahead of them. The moment they started going forward and advancing, in your mind, you put them ahead of you and you couldn't handle it. Don't aim so low to fight for fairness when God has promised you favor. 
deal with it. I mean, if you, if you got that, that offense is coming up, that jealousy is coming up, I'm telling you, you got to deal with that. You got to uproot that. You got to say, God, I know that I have you and you're always with me. I have a purpose and a future. I know I have an inheritance and it doesn't matter what they got. Okay, let me give you the sixth sign of the orphan spirit. Orphans can't access their inheritance. And this is the most scariest thing, devastating thing. They can't. Uh, you got everything. You got it, but you can't access it. The older brother had the whole inheritance, but he couldn't use it. He was wanting a goat when the father gave him the farm. The father said, all I have is your son. It's all yours. What are you talking about? Please come in. Romans talks about this in chapter 8, verse 17, about the posture of being a son, a daughter. He says, now if we are children, somebody say if. That's a big if. Look, Now if we are children, then, there's an if then. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Oh my gosh, we have an inheritance. We have a blessing. If we are children, if I'm a son of God, then I'm a co-heir with Christ. If I'm a daughter of God, then I'm a co-heir with Christ. Look what it says though. If indeed we share. See, the enemy knows this. The enemy knows what your inheritance, the access to the inheritance of the kingdom of God and what that can do in you and through you. And he doesn't want you operating like a son. He doesn't want you in the house. He wants you in the field confused. I don't belong. They don't like me. I can't connect. Slap out of that orphan spirit and get inside the house. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. If we indeed share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Okay, there's six ways that the signs that we, the, we can see the orphan spirit. Let me give you the six ways to overcome an orphan spirit. Y'all like how I give you two messages in once? I don't come often, so I'll give you two sermons at once, okay? I can't just expose the thing and not help you get out of it. Some of y'all are like, oh my God, I got an orphan spirit. Okay, let me help you out, okay? <laughs> what do I do? Here you go, here you go. Number one, number one. Build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Not a list of rules that you're going to keep with God. Build a relationship. Jesus says, I will send you a helper. I will not leave you as orphans. See, when you don't develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're exposing yourself to the orphan spirit. Sooner or later, that anger, isolation, entitlement, that jealousy and offense that I always get overlooked, I just can't connect, that will take root in your life if you don't connect to the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you, you the cure is an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You will either live entitled or encountered. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and good goodness. See, your inheritance is locked up and the password is knowledge of God. You can access your inheritance through knowing God. Listen to me, not through knowing your inheritance. Not through knowing your Bible. I'm, I'm, that's important. I want you to know your Bible. Not through knowing your identity even. No, no, no. I want you to know your identity. But your, your, the access to your inheritance doesn't come from knowing that. It comes from knowing him. Are you, are you, do, you hear, do you see this, you guys? When you, when you begin to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're going to find yourself not just talking about the greatness of God, but living in the greatness of God. You will access your inheritance when you build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Here's the second way you overcome this orphan spirit. you got to renew your mind with the truth of what God says about you, not how you feel about yourself. The older brother told his father, this son of yours, he didn't even call him his brother. He lost perspective of who he was and the context of the household he belonged in. He kept bragging about what he did, and the father focused on one thing. He says, you're a son. You have to renew your mind to what God says about you, whether you feel like you're getting ahead or behind, whether you feel like you're getting promoted or demoted. It's not about that. I'm a son. I'm not just a pastor. I'm a son first. I'm not just a husband. I'm a son first. I'm not just a father to my children. I'm a son first. You have to come back to who you are. See, God is 
far more focused and concerned on who you're becoming, not what you're doing. That's why the father didn't inflate his ego and tell his son, oh, you're right, son. You've been so good. You've worked so hard for the family business. I'm so proud of you, son. He didn't do none of that. He focused not on what he did, but who he was. You're my son. You're my son. Parents don't look at their children like a worker in a factory. Sucking the money out of the family business? No, man. These kids don't deserve it. They couldn't earn it or work for it. It's who they are. You got to begin to see yourself differently. You got to renew your mind with the truth of what God says about you if you want to get rid of that orphan spirit. The third thing, don't let your food get cold by looking at what is on someone else's plate. Okay, that's not in the Bible. I stole it from Instagram, but it was good. Okay, the, 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 the Bible says the one who compares themselves to others is not wise. That one's in the Bible. See, the only person you should be comparing yourself to is yourself yesterday. It's foolish to compare yourself to somebody else. See, in my house, I have a car, an SUV, a scooter, a bike, and a skateboard. It would be foolish for the scooter to look at the car and compare itself to it. And try to act like, how come I can't carry the amount of load? How come I can't go as fast? It would be silly for them not to be functioning in the design that it was meant for. The Bible says, run the race marked out for you. Looking unto Jesus, not to the next lane or the person ahead or the person behind. Run in your lane. Be comfortable in your own skin. Look at your own plate. Your neighbor's grass is different, but you can't see the poop on it. Come on. I might not have gotten a fat calf, but I got a farm, right? I got, I got to look at what I, he has given me and be grateful. You're either going to be grateful or jealous. I choose to be grateful. See, next you can, you can deal with the orphan spirit. You can't deal with that orphan spirit, number four, without letting go of an offended heart. Address those hidden frustrations, those things that you're not voicing and not letting anybody see. Stop fighting for fairness. God didn't promise you fairness. He wants to give you favor. You fight for fairness, and then when you get it, you're going to think you're satisfied until someone else gets favor, and then you're going to get offended again. Almost everyone who has experienced God's favor in the Bible had to go through seasons of unfairness and refuse to be offended. You have to refuse to be offended. Don't let offense take root in your spirit. In that original word in Matthew 8, 7, Jesus uses that word offense, and the Greek word is scandalon. It means this, the trigger of a trap where the bait is set. Offense is the trigger of the trap where the bait is set. Offense is a demonic trap. When you deal with, with, with those silent frustrations, it's going to lead to a deeper, more intimate, honest relationship with God. Instead, we grow more distant and callous, leading to that orphan spirit. When God has a party in the house, you're supposed to be helping host. There's two types of offended people, those who've been mistreated and those who think they've been mistreated but haven't. A, a, lot, of, a lot of our offenses are completely baseless. Offense is like an automatic weapon, though. You know, you pull the trigger, and it just keeps firing by itself. You just get used to this offense spirit. Offense is always tied to pride and control. If you choose to hold on to offense, the orphan spirit will hold on to you. If you want to overcome that resentment, that rejection, that fear of abandonment, that not ability to accept affection, that, that response to authority that you have a triggered response to, that anger that you're dealing with, you got to get rid of the offense that you let take root in your life. Number five, redefine your win from winning in life to winning the lost. See, an orphan focuses on getting more stuff. The father, his success was winning his son back. That was what he was celebrating. But the older brother's success was getting a goat in a party with his friends. See, the real, the real breaker between an orphan and a son, are you obsessed with getting lost people saved? Or are you obsessed with your personal ambitions in life? See, this older brother, he, he got his father's money but he didn't, he didn't get his father's mindset. He got his father's valuables, but he didn't get his father's value system. He got his, value, his, 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 his inheritance, but he didn't have his heart. He got his father's possessions, but he didn't have his father's passion. 
Because when the, the, the dead brother came back, instead of rejoicing and seeing eternal value in him as a human and a brother, he was crying over a goat. Listen, orphans can't make disciples because they only care about themselves, advancing their life, their own ambition, getting ahead. When Jesus was resurrected, he, he found Peter fishing, remember, and he called him back, and he made this, and he, and he sat down with him, and he says, Peter, and he, he lifted up fish, he said, do you love me more than these? You love me more than these. What's, what's your life about? You've got to redefine your win. Are you building your kingdom or his? And then number six, if you want to deal with this orphan spirit once and for all, you've got to surround yourself with your spiritual family. You can be, listen to me, you can be lost in the pig pen, partying, sleeping around, messing around, trying new stuff, being adventurous out there. You could be lost out there. You can also be lost in the, in the field, hanging around church, hanging around the Father's house, but never really connecting. Some of you feel like you're outside of the house kind of looking in and although there's a party that wants to go in there but you're like oh, you're dealing with all those things oh, I don't belong there I don't know anybody there I feel awkward there they're so critical there I'm telling you listen to me that is a lie of the enemy if you want to get rid of this orphan spirit let me say it this way if you want to access the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and every blessing that is hidden in the heavenly realms in Christ for you, then you must be positioned as a son and a daughter. You must be sharing in his life. If you are a child, then you are an heir. If we share with him, I'd love to break some things today. I'd love to spend a moment praying over you. Some of you, I believe it's, it's, it's time, man, it's time. You were rejected, you were hurt, you were abandoned. Your father left, your mother left, there was divorce, someone cheated the way they spoke to you, the way they hurt you. And because of that, you've carried something with you now into this next season of your life. And you feel like you don't belong enemy so good knows that and he's going after people and he's like yeah you don't belong but here's a place no that's not your identity here's your identity this is who you can be you could be recreated like this here's a people for you that's a lie of the enemy you got to deal once and for all with the offense the bitterness the hurt the entitlement the anger the abuse let go of Come back in the house. You're a son. You're complaining about, about things that don't even matter. You're crying about a goat, bro. When all that he has is yours. You're crying about them not accepting you. Listen to me. You're the host of the party. What are you talking about? Are, are you hearing me? There's, there's, there's a shift. Some of you need to go from Jacob to Israel. You need to go from slave to son. From, from a worker, a don't belong, can't connect to a daughter of the king, a co-heir. Christ seated in the heavenly realm. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.